trail cameras, once considered to be controversial, have become the modern hunter's best friend, giving him eyes over his hunting grounds all season long. With this major advancement in scouting, the modern hunter has become the apex predator of the woods. Having mastered stealth and lethality, he moves like a shadow, guided by his silent eyes in the timber. Season after season, his trail cameras script the path to an epic pursuit. Rather than have a long, nuanced discussion on the matter, I decided to see for myself. A friend of mine and I have come to like the saying that trail cameras give you just enough information to keep you guessing. And it might sound a little cliche, but there's actually some truth behind it. See, the idea for this originated from an early season hunt where my friend had six bucks walk within 20 yards of a trail camera in broad daylight. And it took one photo of the event, but somehow missed this freak of nature mainframe eight that walked right past it. If my friend hadn't have been there that day, not only would we not know that this event took place, we wouldn't have known that this buck ever existed. So before we get into the data, let's define the variables that were in play. We placed five non-cellular solar trail cameras in well-known traffic areas on this ridge. Yes, this is the same ridge that our beloved Winter lived on in our last video. We compiled 20 flights from December to January during the last one hour of light per day and documented the amount of instances when deer walked within 25 yards of the camera in 10 minute increments during the last hour of all 20 days. One quick disclaimer on how this was even possible. The cameras were arranged in a sort of pentagon shape with an average spacing of about 155 yards between each of them. This kept them relatively close together, making it a lot easier to cover the area with my drone efficiently. And then as for my drone, my batteries only last 30 to 40 minutes. So for each day in the evening when I was flying for an hour, when a set was running low, I'd fly the drone back to my location, swap in a fresh set of batteries, and return to my post as quickly as possible, usually losing about two minutes per hour in the process. Over this span, that gives us 600 total chances to record deer within 25 yards of the camera. In that time, I recorded right at 308 instances with the drone. The trail cameras were set with stock settings, except for the shutter frequency, which we adjusted to be instant. They were placed on November 25th and given five days to acclimate before the study began. Of the 20 days studied, the trail cameras recorded 59 instances versus the 308 recorded by the drone. A few other little factoids. We had a few times where multiple deer were walking past the camera, and we only got photos of one to two or three deer in front of the camera at one time. And then one thing that you're not gonna see in this video is a trail camera picture of winter and the late season, because we had him walk past multiple cameras even outside of the study time frame, and we don't have a single trail cam picture of winter. So in the end, the trail cameras captured about 20% or one fifth of the potential instances captured by the drone. And this makes you wonder, was winter educated from the time that we set the cameras up on November 25th? I guess that could be the case. But I'm not so sure that that's actually the answer. I think the woods just happen to be a lot larger than we realize. This simple little ridge that has one camera on it, in my example, has a walkable width on average of 98 yards. And it's around 350 yards long to the top whenever it opens up and connects back to the other ridges. That's as if we took seven football fields, flipped them sideways, and stacked them up the ridge. That's a lot of land. In total, the area we concentrated on was around 21 acres. An average trail camera in the woods covers a variable of ranges dependent upon quite a few factors, but the average is around 2,500 to 6,000 square foot. With five cameras spread across a 21-acre section, that means that around 1 to 3% of the landscape is being monitored at any time. Thus, our 20% success rate shows that we were able to place the cameras where the deer were likely traveling. Of the cameras, camera one had 20 instances, and it makes sense because this camera was sort of in a natural travel corridor area. You have a bluff to the south of it and a field edge to the north, making the timber very narrow in this section. So if you were the modern hunter planning your life around these cameras, what could you take away from your trail camera data?
So let's rewind for a minute and view this from a slightly different perspective. A complete scouting operation should probably look something like this. We're going to take conventional scouting and then on-site adaptations from preseason scouting or hunting experience. And then we can look at using the cameras for basic education and very, very tight funnels. Before we break that down, let's get a cliff note out of the way. Hunting aggressively based on trail camera data, I don't recommend it. I know that some people have had success doing it, most just end up wasting their time and probably educating the deer around them. Oftentimes, the successful hunters utilizing this strategy understand their property like the back of their hand. They preemptively have a good idea of how deer travel, where they bed, and where they might want to be that morning or evening on their property. Or they're just getting lucky. I highly, highly recommend saving aggressive hunting tactics for fresh buck sign and or peak rut. Okay, let's identify a few long-term hunting locations. We've already looked at this location in our last video, which would have been phenomenal for a west, northwest, or north wind. So let's go ahead and pick out a few more spots. For starters, both of these areas have towers for rifle season, observation sits, and inclement weather. They're placed over food plots and can be effective at times, but I really want to pick out some stands designed purely for mature bucks. So let's start with this one. The stand isn't just here because there's another bluff. To the east, there's a tight funnel, and this area is actually impassable to deer. And we also have easy access thanks to the road that's coming up the ridge in this area, which makes this spot sort of perfect for a southerly type wind, especially whenever you want to be safe. Next, we can move to the other bluff stand. This one is located on the south side of the field and works best with a northwest and west wind. It gives us yet another location in this area where we're pretty much undetectable. And if we think the deer are actually bedding on the leeward side of this ridge, it makes this location pretty perfect. Then we have two drainage stands. This one is dynamite and perfect for a steady west wind. Scent will be shoved into this ditch and you're more than likely going to see a deer crossing the saddle and wrapping the ditch to the north side or have bucks cruise this travel corridor and wrap back to the north. The other stand is much harder to get to, but it might be the best spot in the area. It's located at a little bench within the ditch. Deer actually funnel from the east and to the south of this location. And if you were a deer moving from the east and wanted to move up through this area, you could take this path through a terribly dense clear cut, or you could walk the habitat transition edge, hop across this little mini bench, and keep on the habitat transition to the north or cruise off of it to the west. Last spot. There's a thin stretch of timber pushed up against an old clear cut and against this field. Anytime you see areas like this, definitely send up red flags that you need to go and inspect it. In this case, most of the deer utilizing these saddles that want to head to the northeast are going to end up walking through this thin stretch of timber. In fact, you'll see that I actually have a bedding marker in this area. It's extremely common to find bucks bedded near features like this. Thin stretch of timber, three different forms of habitat, a saddle or two, and a couple of ditches. There's too many things going on for it not to be a good location. After sitting in these stands for a handful of times, that's when you can start to determine whether or not you've chosen your stand wisely, or if you need to move it a little bit based on your experience. Personally, whenever setting up a long-term stand, I often end up moving it around 20 to 40 yards throughout the season in some cases, just because I notice deer consistently moving around me outside of bow range. Okay, so we've developed a few long-term stand setups and a general basis of how to hunt them. But what if we wanted to know more about the deer in the area? That is where trail cameras can sort of come into play, purely as an educational scouting tool, and almost nothing more than that. In most cases, I recommend going ahead and placing cameras at the base of or nearby your stand location. That'll minimize foot traffic in the area, especially if it's non-cellular, and simplifies the process altogether. After those cameras are up, then you can start looking at tighter funnels and areas that have sub-30 yard width type terrain features where you know deer are going to travel and you can set up a camera or two in those areas for long-term scouting. And sometimes these funnels can be created by terrain features that you're unable to identify until you put boots on the ground. My next video is actually going to be focusing on buck movement and with that we're going to analyze ways to study topo prior to getting boots on the ground so that you can identify pinch points and funnels that may be more difficult to understand until you start piecing different variables together. Once your funnel cameras are up, leave them alone. You can keep them to where they send photos to your phone if you have self-control, but being that you probably don't, think about turning the feature off altogether and saving some money to spend on arrows in the future. Worth noting, I recommend using solar-powered cameras or external batteries to ensure they stay alive long enough throughout the time frame that they're up. Set an event on your calendar for the day or the week after your season ends. Try to put them at the back of your mind and forget that you put the cameras out at all and then come back and collect them once your calendar notifies you at the end of season. To pair with this data, I would highly recommend documenting the days that you go into the area that you're hunting. 
Even if it's private land and all you did was drive around the property for fun, documenting the basics, temperature, wind, and time of day, then take your camera intel at the end of season, plus your human pressure data throughout the season, and have a fun time trying to piece things together and see if anything clicks. The scale of this study was a little bit small, but it has served as a sort of catalyst for other ideas moving into the coming season. You can think of this video sort of as trail cameras part one. If you have any takeaway from this video, I hope that you've been inspired to utilize cameras for educational purposes, and please don't base your complete hunting strategy around them. A good mindset is that you hunt casually based on conditions that work for your pre-selected locations, and you hunt aggressively based on fresh sign located while scouting. If you've learned anything new or simply just enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, and consider commenting below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.